Good evening. I was waiting for the thunderous herd to come in at the end, but it just wasn't coming. But with this kind of forecast, it's just nice to gather where it's somewhere kind of warm. I'm going to draw your attention to it now, and hopefully I'll, have to re I'll remind you later, is that when you get to page five and you make the turn, it says that's page six, but where you really need to be is on page seven. They're turned around. So when you do the, when you sing, Lord, bid your servant go in peace, you go to what's page seven and you have the verse and then we follow the service. Then we come back. That's to make sure Lutherans are awake on a cold and wet and rainy evening. So shall we begin with the singing of our, our opening hymn? Shall we stand? O oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let
Let them turn back because of their shame who say, ah, ah. I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Please be seated. Hopefully you all were given the uh, questions for this evening for the time of learning. There's about eight of them on there. Uh, they're all about the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. And um, you can begin by calling out a, a number, and I'll try to give an answer. One. Well, that's a good place to start. Yeah. I just copied this right out of the Catechism 1986. I don't think that varied very much from the Catechism. Most of you were confirmed after 19. 43, I would assume. So this is pretty much the same. No, you're, you're a little younger, but, uh, but it was the same answers. Those who are, A, who are openly ungodly and repentant, including those who take part in a non-Christian religious worship. B, those unforgiving, refusing to be reconciled, they thereby, they show thereby that they really do not believe that God forgives them either. C, those of a different confession of faith, since the Lord's Supper is a testimony of the unity of faith. D, those who are unable to examine themselves, such as infants, people who have not received proper instruction, or the unconscious. Uh, there are some places where they do give communion to infants. So that's why it's mentioned here. I've never been in a church that did that, but I've heard that it, it, it has been done, including in some Lutheran churches. Uh, that, that one B, those who are unforgiving, refusing to be reconciled, they show thereby that they really do not believe that God forgives them either. I think that's fine to say in a textbook sense, but in a real life sense, just as an example, today one boy was really upset in daycare because he got in a fight with his friend. And he was sobbing and he was in tears. Well, I don't think they had quite enough time to settle down and to be reconciled. Was he unforgiving? Oh, he's just too emotional at that time. I, I think. This one we gotta leave a little bit more to God than to ourselves to see who's forgiving or who isn't. And uh, uh, I think all of us remember the bully in school and we bring up his name, it isn't Tom. It's that Tom back then. You know, I, you know, all of us have those kinds of feelings. It isn't that we don't want to be forgiving, but we are just get too emotionally involved and I think we have to be somewhat um, cautious there and leave a little bit wider berth than in the absolute, absolute sense. Do any oh, four on the front? Well, that, four on the back goes with four on the four on the front, and it's amazing. Your wife asked the same question earlier today, <laughs> so. What fundamental, what fundamental beliefs one should commonly share when partaking uh, of communion in the Lutheran Church? I think, to me, there's at least four very basic things that when you commune in the Lutheran Church that you should share in common. One, you're baptized. Baptism is a sacrament of initiation, and it's necessary to be baptized before. She's over here. Now that he's a grandpa, he can't keep it all straight. <laughs> right here. Do you need any more help, Warren? <laughs> oh. Just watch, you'll sit in the wrong pew. Laughter <laughs> 
<laughs> oh. So, what fundamental beliefs baptized? You have to use the, it should be elements of bread and wine must be used, not grape juice, soda crackers. It should be bread and wine. And we try to use unleavened bread because that was what was available to Jesus at the time. And Lutherans believe in a very common doctrine that in, with, and under the bread and wine of communion are the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a high view of the sacrament as being, here is the very body and blood of Jesus given to the communicant. Lutherans, like Catholics, share in this high understanding of the Lord's Supper. Church bodies that have a higher regard for the sacrament tend to limit those who are, should come forward and receive it. Four, the need to believe that God extends and offers forgiveness of sins in this sacred meal. For example, the reform do not believe it's the body and blood, and the way you're forgiven is you think upon the Lord and what he's done for you. And that's the way God does work. But in communion, there's this also this additional benefit that he comes with his very body and blood for us to forgive us. And that Lutherans really closely tie, here's the body and blood of Christ for our forgiveness. So I think you need to be, feel you're forgiven. And the Catholic Church, if you're a faithful Catholic, you probably wouldn't commune in the Lutheran Church because uh, the Catholics believe that you get a little bit more drop of forgiveness or grace when you come to communion. And that, and that isn't really offered in a Catholic viewpoint that this is a valid sacrament because it was an ins instituted by a priest who was given apostolic succession. That's the long answer. Did I, did you, any clarification? Okay. Any other questions? Five. What about announcing for communion? How many of you have had to announce for communion in your earlier years? About half the congregation. How many of you have no idea what that means? Yeah. It, it was a practice that was quite common in the 40s, 50s, and it started to fall out of disuse in the 1960s. What you had to do is you had to go on Friday or Saturday night at the point in time when it was to, to the parsonage and, and announce to the pastor that you wanted to have communion that day, or the next Sunday. Well, you know, here we, you, you talk about how open the altar should be, it was even closed to the church members because if you just showed up, you weren't supposed to commune or you were kind of encouraged to announce first and disencouraged to uh, just show up and take communion. And I think it was a lot more practical when the church, our churches didn't celebrate communion very often. At one point in time, it was four times a year. I think all of you are too young to remember that. And I remember in our home, my parish, once a month, first Sunday of the month, that was Communion Sunday. Then it went to one and three. And I remember in Mellon, he was already old when I was there, but he said there was an old member. I mean, this is long ago. When they went to this more frequent communion, he, she told him that maybe you send that much, but I don't. I'm not going to go to communion that often. And that's another, there was a little bit of a misunderstanding of what communion was about. But I think the more often you celebrate communion, it's far more difficult to set aside all those hours for announcing. And in the Catholic Church, it was called confession. And in the Lutheran Church, it was called announcing. But I think, I never did it, but I assume what you did is you told them that your name, you were probably announcing the whole family, and you're going to come. The pastor wrote it down and went back for have supper. Was that kind of the way it went? So, eight. Okay. What about the passage in the Bible that speaks about going to communion in an unworthy manner? Will you go to hell? I read it in two different translations. The first one, I think, was... Uh, 
the New International Version. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. The key word there is guilty. But if you read the same thing in the King James, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the body of the, blow, of the Lord. And that word damnation I underlined because that's the key word. You know, if you ever go to communion in an unworthy manner, are you going to go to hell? Well, who would ever go to communion? If, why take the risk? I mean, that, you, you can easily see where you could get into that discussion. So skip nine and go down to that word that's in Greek, krima. The best trans that's the word that's used in the original language there. It should be best translated as judgment. If the writer wanted to mean damnation, he would have used the word kata krima. And kata in increases what the judgment is, which then would be damnation. I think it's unfortunate that the translators for the King James back in the 17th century used the word damnation because that is not what is meant there. Now, if you, part, if you come to communion and it isn't, you're not perfect, that doesn't invalidate the communion. But um, the only way you could go to hell taking communion is if you were an unbeliever and you stayed in unbelief and you didn't believe. That th this passage, the way it is explained or written in the King James, just gives totally the wrong impression of what the actual text says. Was that good enough? Okay. I want to make sure I hit nine, so I'm going to do that. Pastoral concern for the individual is always part of the decision who should commune and who should not commune. You know, there are some occasions where all of those things listed in number one, maybe a pastor should just ignore. Not all, but you know, I remember one time one of my friends, I, he drove to school, I rode with him to college, and he was about 20, and um, he, died, he got into a snowmobile accident. I don't know what he hit, a tree or rock. He severed his, mid, his brain, and he died. And his girlfriend came to communion the week after his funeral and so on. I don't know if she was, I don't, she never communed before, so I assumed that she wasn't Lutheran or, or whatever. I, I never did ask him. Now, Bobby was, you know, I rode the school bus with him for 12 years. I knew him well. I think the pastor made the right decision. I don't know if she was Lutheran or not, but at that time, the family was in such utter agony and pain. I think it would be cruel not to have given her communion. So that's a pastoral concern that, that one has to uh, weigh in your own mind. There are two occasions where I think that communion was given and it shouldn't have happened. Uh, it was at our Redeemer. One time somebody just showed up in the back sitting and then he started, were, were you there? He started getting up and asking questions. Yeah, during the sermon. I didn't ask for questions. He just got up and started asking. And it, it was a disturbance but to a minor degree. But then uh, my members around him just sort of, I think they handcuffed him and brought him up for communion. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know if he, he, that shouldn't have been that encouraged that day. Then one at Easter, uh, one young man with a baby, about, not baby, but an infant or a child about one to two came up. I gave him the bread, or he got the bread, and his kids started howling because they wanted it, so he stuffed it in his mouth. So, boy, 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 what's going to happen now? So, uh, I, I don't think the Lord's Supper should be used to silence a kid. I think you better find another method. But. So, yes. Number two, 
oh, the closed versus open communion. I, I think this whole discussion isn't closed, open. It's kind of a continuum. On one side is closed, and the other side is really open. And most people would fall kind of in the middle. Closed would be you only serve communion to your own members. The next st step in this one is you close, the communion is served to your denomination. The next one, uh, those who share a common belief in the Lord's Supper, that's the body and blood of Christ. You know, that's, that's getting to be more open, but it's still saying that you need to believe it's the body and blood of Christ to commune. And the other one is that the Lord's Supper is open to all. Uh, you know, I, I can see pastors, you know, in the Missouri Synod kind of going off to the left. Pastors in the ELCA might be going off too far to the, to the right and letting everybody commune. In a sense, that devalues communion because you're serving the body and blood of Christ and inviting them to come, and they don't even believe that it's the body and blood of Christ. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, because baptism is a sacrament of initiation. Well, I already went one or two minutes over the time I intended, so let's just keep on singing. Tonight, our Passion History centers around, of course, Jesus, but also Pontius Pilate. We continue to read. When Herod saw Jesus, he was delighted, for he had long wished to see him because of we had heard of him, and he hoped to see him do a miracle. He questioned Jesus repeatedly, but he gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood there and vehemently accused him. Herod and his soldiers mocked him. They put on him a splendid robe and sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that same day. For before this, they had been at enmity 
with each other. Then Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You have brought this man before me as one subverting the people. See now, I have examined him before you and have found nothing in this man guilty of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Mark this, he has done nothing worthy of death. I will have him punished and release him. Now, at the feast, it was the governor's custom to release to the crowd any one prisoner whom they asked for. They had a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. He was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder in the uprising in the city. Pilate knew that it was out of malice that the chief priests handed Jesus over. Therefore, he said to them, do you want me to release for you Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Pilate asked them again, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man, and release for us Barabbas. While Pilate was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Do not have anything to do with this man. I have suffered much over him in a dream today. Again, Pilate addressed them, for he wished to release Jesus. He said to them, what shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? What shall I do with him, whom you call King of the Jews? They all cried out, crucify him. Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? For I have found no guilt worthy of death in him. I will therefore punish him and let him go. And they cried out all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers of the governor led him away into the praetorium. They gathered the whole band of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put on him a purple robe. When they had woven a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. They knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him took the reed and struck him on the head. They knelt down and did him homage. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I bring him out to you that you may know I find him not guilty. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I do not find him guilty. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more afraid and went again into the judgment hall and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you? And I have the power to release you. Jesus answered, You would not have any power at all over me unless it had been given to you from above. For that reason, he who handed me over to you has the greater sin. This prompted Pilate to go on trying to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in the palace that is called the pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him. 
crucify him. Pilate said to, unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but rather a riot was underway, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this man. See it to it yourselves. Then all the people responded, His blood be on us and on our children. Then Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, gave sentence that it should be as they demanded. He released to them Barabbas, for whom they asked, the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. And he had Jesus flogged and gave him over to their will to be crucified. The soldiers mocked him, stripped him of his purple robe, and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Thus far the reading of the Passion history. The response read on page four. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name that I may walk in your truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. We sing the theme hymn, O Holy Spirit, Give Us Grace.
Will you pray with me? Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. And may our hearts be centered on you, who never leaves you, never leaves us, or forsakes us. Amen. Please be seated. This year, our midweek Lenten services have revolved around eye diseases. Tonight, we're going to focus on the eye disease of glaucoma. I want you to think of your eye as an inflatable basketball. There's a lot of business that goes on on the outside of the eye with the lens, the cornea, and all of that. And in the back of the eye, on the inside, is the retina, which really is a marvelous thing to pick up uh, everything that we see and make the image. But then, in the middle of the eye, like in the middle of a basketball, there's a substance. In a basketball, it's air, and it's the air that gives the ball its shape. If you have too little air, you bounce it, and it thuds. Too much air, it's like a Super Bowl. The eye is like that. You have to have some pressure in your eye to give it shape. Too much pressure is called glaucoma, and it can cause blindness. It is a very serious disease and has to be taken seriously and treated or else you lose vision. Hall of Famer Kirby Puckett of the Minnesota Twins, his career ended because one day in spring training he woke up and he couldn't see out of one eye, glaucoma, too much eye pressure. Something that could have easily been treated if it was caught in time, but it wasn't. Spiritually, Pressure is good for us, some pressure in life, because it will turn us to Jesus as our only hope and only way out. Too much pressure, it's a big problem. Tonight, our biblical character is Pilate, who cracked under pressure and sentenced our Lord Jesus Christ to death by crucifixion. Look, Pilate himself, he was never welcomed in Judea by the Jewish people. And Pilate's ruling style was just a big rub against them. He made a lot of mistakes. Early on, he had mixed blood of the Galileans and had them murdered. He, it was really stupid. He was already in deep, dark trouble with the Jewish people. And you read tonight that they said, we have no, we're going to report, basically they said, we're going to report this to Rome and to Caesar. And Pilate, your political career is shot. And Pilate was a politician, always campaigning for the next high office. He didn't have to do it before people, but he had to have the blessing of Caesar. So they, the Jews had him over the barrel. He couldn't afford any more bad reports coming out of it. And then they put in the middle of his lap is Jesus. The Jews wanted him crucified, and only Pilate could sentence him. They couldn't do it. They had to have Pilate's blessing to crucify Jesus. Pilate, I think, was an honorable man in many ways. He wanted to do what was right. Pilate heard all the testimony of the Jewish leaders, and Pilate saw right through it, knew it was false. The Bible tells us that it was out of envy that the chief priests handed Jesus over to them. And so Pilate was very direct with those Jewish leaders. What crime has he committed? There was nothing. So wanting to release Jesus, he proposed a prisoner exchange. I'll release one prisoner to you as it is the custom during the Sabbath or Passover. And he offered him Barabbas, who was a noted criminal and a murderer, or Jesus, who really had done nothing wrong. And the chief priest stirred up the population enough to demand that they release Barabbas. 
This was a midnight trial, all trumped up. Just a few rabid people there, not thousands of people. And then Pilate asked, what shall I do with the one you call king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted all the louder. Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Pilate was a good-hearted soul, but he cracked under pressure of the chief priests and the opinion of the people. Even though he attempted to wash his hands over the situation, that blood could never leave him. He cracked under pressure. Is that the way it is oftentimes with us? The pressures of life, we don't turn to Jesus and see in him there will be strength to be delivered. We're too prone to compromise with the easy road and not the right road. But there was one there that evening that didn't crack under enormous pressure. That was Jesus Christ. Isaiah, 700 years before the crucifixion, used words like stritten, smitten, and afflicted. In Isaiah's own words, he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. He was enduring that great weight. Hours before this, he was in Gethsemane's garden, perspiring great drops of blood. So, he did not crack, and because he did not crack, he went to the cross and died for us so that he might open heaven for us. What a blessing. How do you respond under pressure? First of all, we're never going to have a stress-free, pressure-free life. There is always going to be some pressure. And that probably helps us keep in shape because if we thought this, we didn't have any stress, any problems, we might begin to think this is heaven on earth. But it isn't. There are problems and stress, and we, some of it are our own making, and we have to confess before God that we've sinned and lean upon Christ's forgiveness. Some pressure is healthy, but too much pressure can be an opportunity to crack. Pilate was an example of someone who cracked under pressure. You know, every day we have work-related issues. We're physically weak and knocked down. And when the pressure is the greatest, we ask, will we crack or not? I would suggest three things, or two things for sure. Evaluate the threat or danger. Some things that we fret about and think are really stressful and pressureful, they're, they're not, if we really stop to think about it. They'll soon end. And then <clears throat> we need to think that upon Jesus and the pain and the suffering he endured for our salvation. He didn't crack. He endured the cross. It's suffering and it's shame. You're problems are never as great as what he had to go through. And then as a help, I hope you could commit this Bible passage to mind. I will never leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and a life everlasting. Amen. Wayne, is this going to be a problem? Do you, do you have it in the right, the service in the right order on the screen? Okay. If you're following along in the bulletin, remember from page five, you go to page seven and then back to page six. Shall we stand and sing the canticle hymn?
in the end. In the prayers of the church, we'll remember Reverend Gary Danke, who's undergoing treatments for cancer in Georgia, for Pastor Joe Schultz, who's hospitalized at Sacred Heart, for Jan Zimmerman, undergoing treatment for cancer, and then we have something joyful to announce, the birth of Henry Grohn, son of Clara and Ben Grohn, born on... Uh, Monday, and he came out ready for school. Nine pounds and how many ounces? <laughs> Two ounces. So let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with your servants, Gary, for Joe, for Jan, that you'd be with them in their illness, that you would bless doctors and nurses and hospital staff and medical teams with good knowledge about medicine, and bless the medications and treatments that are given so that health and strength can be returned. And be with them in the dark hours of suffering and pain and assure them that you will never leave them nor forsake them. Lord, in your mercy. And we rejoice at the birth of Henry Grohn, son of Clara and Ben. What a blessing he's already been. Keep and preserve him, keep him safe, and grant him in due time the blessings of holy baptism and union with Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear all of our prayers for the sake of him who suffered and died and rose again for us, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said. Amen. We speak the words of the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. He taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you full pardon and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And O oh God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works proceed, give to your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. Our closing hymn as my faith looks up to be up loved. <laughs> A good thing the day is ending. My faith looks up to thee.
on the way out, we can use them one more week. The guts, use the wastebasket or take it home. Also, the elders will meet in the church council after service, just briefly in the upper fellowship hall. Are there any other announcements that we need to make?